Okay, so we are in Yeshua, Isaiah chapter 1. This is the Haftarah portion for this week's Torah portion, which is Devarim, or words. And uh, so some background on this, um, this Haftarah. Now, we're going to read this Haftarah. Oh, it's only 27 verses. Um, we're going to read through it, and there's going to be some verses that really stand out to you that you've heard 100,000 times before. But you've heard them pulled out of context. And maybe you've never even read the whole first uh, chapter of Isaiah to put things in its place. And so that's what we really, really want to do as we talk about Tisha B'Av and what, what this is all about. So this week's Haftarah is the third Haftarah, which is Haftarah is always a portion of the prophets or the writings that go along with the, uh, the Parsha. Um, there's a series of three uh, Haftarah, Haftarot leading up to Tisha B'Av that are called the three of affliction, okay? Um, and this is the last of those three, and they're read in the three weeks of mourning for Jerusalem um, from the 17th of Tammuz to the 9th of Av. So during these three weeks, um, they're also called the straits, uh, the, the, the dire straits sometimes, as the Jewish people are preparing to mourn for uh, the loss of Jerusalem, the temple, and exile. Uh, and so this is the last one that is read. Isaiah relays to the Jews a godly vision that he experiences, chastising the residents of Judah and Jerusalem. And that's really important. We're going to talk about that. For having rebelled against him, criticizing them for repeating their errors and not abandoning their sinful ways, even after having been reprimanded and punished. He says, woe to a sinful nation, a people heavy with iniquity, right? Harsh words are employed comparing the Jewish leaders to the rulers of Sodom and Gomorrah, which we'll read about. Um, and God talks about his distaste for their sacrifices and offerings. And then he ends on a gentler note, encouraging the people to repent sincerely and perform acts of justice and kindness towards the needy. Um, the first word of this, um, of this haftarah is the vision, right? The vision of Isaiah. Vision in Hebrew is chazon, C-H-A-Z-O-N, chazon, is the word vision. And so this Parsha is always read on the Sabbath that precedes Tisha B'Av, okay? So this is called in Jewish tradition Shabbat chazon, or the Sabbath of vision, okay? Um, most of the time in the Haftarah, there will be a connection back to the Parsha, Right? So there'll be a theme, a word uh, in the Haftarah, in the prophets uh, or the writings that connect back to the Parsha. That's usually what we're looking for when we read the Haftarah is how does this later uh, development in the Word of God relate back to the Torah. But several times a year, there are Haftarahs that are chosen because of the time of the year. Okay, because of the calendar and what's going on in the calendar, certain Haftarot were chosen to line up with that. And so that's exactly what we have here. There's no uh, inherent or direct connection from Isaiah 1 back to Devarim, uh, Parsha Devarim. But we do have this special time, which is Tisha B'Av. And so this is always read on the Shabbat before Tisha B'Av, Shabbat Chazon. So Isaiah. One of the important things, I think, that we do as we, we read the prophets, um, because I don't know how your understanding of the prophets are, um, but we have actually the first book of the prophets. Who knows what it is? If you've been on a Wednesday night, Kyle has talked about this. I've talked about it. What's the first book of the prophets that we have in our Tanakh? Joshua, which you might be surprised that it's Joshua. How many of you think of Joshua as a prophet? Joshua is in Christian Bibles uh, filed under the historical, uh, the historical category of, of a Tanakh, uh, erroneously called Old Testament. Um, but Joshua is historical. However, in the Tanakh, in the Jewish reckoning, it is the first book of prophecy. Prophecy, the books of prophecy also include Kings and Samuel, which is very interesting, right? Um, so Isaiah, we think about Isaiah, and how many of you, show of hands, because I want to know I'm not alone, how many of you have a hard time placing the prophets in time? Anybody? Good. All right. You're just making me feel good. I appreciate it. 
But it seems like we have, because we read our Bibles in, the, in our Christian Bible, we read through the, the Torah and the, the prophets and the historical books and all in a certain um, chronology or a certain order, it's, it almost forces a certain chronology, right? So after the people come into the land, Israel comes into the land, then you have Joshua, Judges, right? And then and you have you know, Samuel, Kings, then you have the prophets. So it, it can force us to kind of feel like, well, all this stuff happened with the kings, and then there were prophets. And what we don't understand is that there's an overlap here between the kings and the prophets, and these things are happen, happening concurrently. And so um, Isaiah is a prophet. He's a priest, and he's a, uh, a, a, a Jerusalemite, right? Uh, you have Jeremiah, who is from Anatote and comes into Jerusalem. Um, you have Ezekiel, who is kind of rural. Uh, uh, Isaiah is from Jerusalem. He lives in Jerusalem, okay, the capital city of Israel. Um, he is during the last years of the northern kingdom. So think about the, the history here and what we're, what we're doing. So we have King Saul, right, Shaul HaMelech. Then we have David HaMelech, King David. Then we have Shlomo HaMelech, King Solomon. And then after King Solomon, the nation of Israel splits, right? You have the southern and northern kingdom. The northern kingdom, what we call today the lost tribes eventually, right? That gets gobbled up by Assyria in 700s BC. And then the southern kingdom, which gets taken to Babylon in the 500s. Solomon, I mean, I'm sorry, Isaiah is during the last years of the northern kingdom before they get taken into captivity. So Isaiah is actually very early in Israel's um, kingdom history. Does that making sense so far? Um, and he is, uh, he, he, he is prophesying during the reign of four kings, Judah, Uzziah, Yotam, and Ahaz, and actually Hezekiah. Uh, he's also a contemporary of the prophets Amos, Hosea, and Micah. So not only do you have prophets that are concurrent with the kings of Israel, but you also have prophets that are, that are contemporaries of other prophets, right? And you have to believe that these prophets are hearing each other's prophecies. So if you ever read Hosea and you go like, I've read stuff like that in, in Isaiah, there's a reason for that. It's because they're hearing each other's prophecies and God is doing something uh, through multiple people. So as we get into this Haftarah, I want to read this as kind of a... a a setup for this because I think this is really, really important. This is in the um, the Art Scroll Stone Humash. If you have this, you have the note in here. But I think this is this is these are strong words, and we've said for a couple years now. We we've, we've used the statement that Scripture was written for us, but not to us. Right? Scripture was written for us, but not to us. And so you're all familiar with that statement. And I believe that this first chapter of Isaiah really embodies this idea. That this was, that Isaiah 1 was not written to us, but boy, can we read it for us. And so I'm going to read this note, and then we'll jump in and, and pick off some sections of, of Isaiah 1. So it says, this haftarah, the, the final one in the three of affliction, is always read on the Shabbat that precedes Tisha B'Av. As Rabbi Mendel Hirsch points out, listen to this. The prophet does not lament because the Beit HaMikdash was destroyed or the temple was destroyed. Rather, he laments over the underlying causes of that destruction. And this annual lesson serves to focus the national mourning of Tisha B'Av not to the past, but to the present. Now, this is Rabbi Hirsch several generations ago. But I believe his, his statement to the present is true. It is not enough to bemoan the great loss suffered by the Jewish people with the destruction of the land, the holy city, Jerusalem, and the holy temple. But we must use our mourning as a way of initiating an examination of our present day feelings, thoughts, and deeds. What have we done to eliminate the attitudes and practices that thousands of years ago sent our ancestors into exile? Not once, not twice. But three times, I'll add, but three times. How have we improved our approach to the divine service as a way of life, a life devoted to duty rather than a substitute for it? 
as our verbal offerings, like the animal offerings described by the prophet, are they merely perfunctory, performed rituals, never internalized, never spoken from the heart, just from the lips and outward? Let me read that again because here's the, the challenge with us uh, and our backgrounds is that we read Isaiah 1 and we go, well, obviously God hates sacrifices, right? Obviously God hates Israel's offerings. He hates Israel's new moons. He hates Israel's Sabbaths. He hates all the, the, what we call the ritual law, ceremonial law. God obviously hates all that. Look, it says it right here in Isaiah 1. But there's also something that God hates in Isaiah 1, and that's Israel's prayers. See, we can have this self-righteous replacement thing that says, well, God hated all the ceremonial stuff that Israel was doing, but now he honors us because we have true worship, which is prayer. And we can get all high and mighty and big-headed that at least we're not doing what Israel did because God never wanted that. What he wanted was their, their prayers. But we also come to that understanding because we in the Western church have a really bad habit of not reading all the way through. I haven't talked about this in years, but one of my big... One of the first things I saw when I came into, into Torah was I actually started reading the Bible, context, chapters at a time. And in, in that point in my life, my recent history had been very Pentecostal, you know, spirit-filled, non-denominational um, circles. And I heard a lot of sermons. I, I think I talked last week about T.D. Jakes. I heard a lot of T.D. Jakes. I heard a lot of preachers like that, really fiery, really, you know, passionate preachers and one of the verses that they constantly went to, it was, it was a preaching verse, it was a shouting verse, was God will restore the years that the locust and the canker worm and the palmer worm stole from you, right? Don't make me tune up because I'll do it without a piano player. But that's the verse. If you've ever listened to a T.D. Jakes, if you've ever listened to 20 minutes of a T.D. Jakes sermon, there's a good chance you've heard that verse. That God will restore the years that these things stolen from you. Now, the implication is, and not even the implication, sometimes it's outright said that the reason that those things were stolen from us or the person doing the stealing is who? Satan. The devil, Satan, Lucifer, whatever. That's the implication, and that's the way it's connected, that God will, you know, I'm going to go to the enemy's camp and take back what he stole from me, right? There's a song, right? I went to the enemy's camp, and I took back what he stole from me, right? All right, so, the, yeah, I'm let me get up. No, I'm joking. I'm not going to do it. Um, there, there's, there's this connection between the two, but go back and read Joel chapter 2. And it's one verse. Y'all, some of you have heard me rant about this. If you have it, enjoy. It's one verse. God says, I will restore the years that I uh, stole from you, comma, not a new verse, same verse. The next three words are really important. My great army. It goes on to say, which I sent. That flips the whole doctrine on, on its head. You have, to, you have to go, well, okay, but wait. I've been told my whole life that Satan, the enemy, the demons, the whatever, came and took all this stuff from me, and I've got to go back and get it from Satan. But that's not what the scripture that we're quoting actually says. The scripture that we're quoting says, God, Hashem, our Father, Avinu, Shabbat Shemaim, our Father in the heavens, he's the one that sent these destructive forces for our good to correct us. So, see, we have this really bad habit. What if more people, when life goes wrong, instead of rebuking the devil, actually started to seek God and say, what are you trying to teach me? Instead of wasting our energy, our emotion, our spiritual energy, rebuking the devil, who's standing there going like, what did I do? There's a story in Judaism that's told that a rabbi is walking along the street, and he comes along Satan, and he's sitting on the curb, and he's just bawling his eyes out. He's squalling his eyes out. 
And the rabbi sits down next to him, <laughs> like, like a rabbi would, and he goes, puts his arm around and goes, buddy, what's wrong? And he goes, if only I was guilty of all the things the Christians accuse me of. Satan is standing around going like, wait, I don't deserve credit for this. Read the book again. And, in, and what is created in Christianity is it's created an, a religion that if we, if we just took the words that we speak, it's, it would seem like the church at large actually worships Satan more than it does God. Because that's who we're always rebuking. That's who we're always talking. Not everybody, but in some circles, the Satan's behind every bush. He's behind every tree. He's on every leaf. He's on, you know. And we carried some of that into the Hebrew Roots movement where that people won't even walk into a store from Thanksgiving to after the first of the year because there's Christmas trees up. And the Christmas tree demon might jump on you and, and you know, and infiltrate your soul with Christmassy goodness. I, I don't know. But it's developed this whole theology thing where we almost worship Satan as much as we worship God. And that all comes, that whole world comes in part, in large part, from a misreading, or not a misreading, a non-reading of all of the context of Joel chapter 2. We've done the same thing with Isaiah, where we've taken part of a verse and we've gone where God, you know, where God says, oh, I, you know, I hate your offerings, whatever, and we've gone, see, God hated the offerings. Now we have real true worship after Yeshua. But we never read later what God continues to say. I want to read this quote again because I think it's fantastic. He says, are our verbal offerings like the animal offerings prescribed by the prophet, merely perfunctory performed rituals, never internalized, never spoken from the heart, just from the lips and outward. It says, and as Rabbi Hirsch puts it, is our, in his world, Jewish contemporary spirit already so deeply imbued with the Jewish spirit that so filled with Jewish way of thinking, with the knowledge of Judaism, with knowledge of the all comprising and deep contents of the Torah, that it could be a worthy form of environment for the temple of God to be erected in our midst. Does not the gulf between Israel and his God yawn perhaps wider than ever? What he's saying is, are, are Jews today so full of Judaism that there's really no room for the temple? And I think we could really easily say, are Christians so full of Christianity that there's no room for the temple? Are Christians so full of Jesus that there's no room for the... Oh, it's going to get really messy today. Really, really messy. Travis loves, it. Travis loves it. Thank you, Travis. I got one on my corner. In my corner. No, I got more than that, I know. This is a model of the second temple that our good friend Hanok gifted to, to us. There's a bigger one. For teaching purposes, it was like 700 bucks. I was like, well... Maybe next year. Um, I will have it, just not right now. This building is what we're talking about. This structure, right? And its destruction, its fall, and the destruction of Jerusalem as a whole, and the exile of the people. Now, I love this model. I, I, I sit and I just stare at it. I'm infatuated with it. And I think I can safe to say this. I already checked it with Joe Good, and he said I wasn't a heretic. I think Rabbi Hirsch imbues the same words. This building, for all of its glory, all of its holiness, all of what it means to the Jewish people and should mean to us, this building is a means to an end. This building is a means to an end. Why is there no standing temple today? I believe Rabbi Hirsch answers that is because not only are the Jewish people not ready, the world is not ready for it. I'm going to put this right here because I'm going to use it again. So the sages tell us that there is one main reason. There are others, but there's one main reason why Israel's temples 
first and second temple, and exiles happened. Now, if you know your Bible well, what would you think would be the reason, the main reason why God allowed the temples to be destroyed, Jerusalem to be destroyed, and the exile to happen? What would be the one, what was Israel doing that God would finally say, like, uh, I'm done. Because of this one sin you're committing, I'm out. The big I? Idolatry. Idolatry, right? Then we have the whole litany of other things that Israel was involved in. Sexual sin, all these, all these kinds of things. I'm going to grab the, the whiteboard. There is a, a term, though, that the reason why temples were destroyed, Jerusalem was destroyed, and the Jewish people were exiled is this term here, Sinat Chinam. Sinat Chinam is the reason that the sages give for this destruction and why we mourn. And what does this translate to? Baseless hatred. Baseless hatred of whom? Our first inclination might think, might be to think Hashem. Obviously, Israel hated God because they did idolatry, they're all these sins and all these things. But no, that's not the Jewish thought process. Sinat Chinam is baseless hatred of your brother or your kinsman. So let's kind of think about this as we take a trip all the way back. What is the first time Israel is in captivity? Where? Egypt, right? Egypt. What moment or what series of events led them to even go to Egypt in the first place? There was a famine, right? But what happened between these brothers? They hated Joseph. The scripture says they hated Joseph and they actually couldn't say a good thing about him. Sinat Hinam. Let's think about the second. The destruction of the first Beit HaMikdash, first temple, and the splitting of the northern and southern kingdom. Remember, Shaul, David, Shlomo. The kingdom splits. What happens when the kingdom splits? There's these two guys, one of them Solomon's son, right? And they come together and they, and they try to figure out what, and they, they could not get along, they could not come to terms, and so the kingdom split. Some listen to younger advisors, some listen to other people. The kingdom splits, and you have really bad drawing of Israel here, but you have is, the nation of Israel, and you have Jerusalem, let's say here, right? The kingdom splits, and you have the northern kingdom and southern kingdom, and they the northern kingdom builds two golden calves, one at Dan, all the way up here, and one at Bethel, okay? And the reason for this, they say, is it's too far for you to go to Jerusalem to worship. The, God, the place where God said, you will worship at the place where I establish my name forever, well, if you're in this bottom part of the northern kingdom, you're actually closer to Jerusalem than you are to Bethel or Dan. But there is this hatred in Israel between those of the two kingdoms. So much so that when the northern kingdom gets taken away, the sentiment is kind of like, well, thank God, finally, we can be a kingdom all our own, the righteous kingdom. We're going to get to that in a minute. That's the second, or the first temple, the second exile. The third, the second temple and the third exile is the time of Yeshua. We've talked about this. What are the main divisions of Judaism in the first century? Pharisees, Sadducees, Herodians. Essenes, zealots, all right? So we have these major divisions. 
that were against each other. They were polarized against each other for how to move the nation forward out of Roman oppression, how to bring Messiah, all the, how the temple should be run, all these things. But even in the world of the Pharisees, let's just take them just for a, a minute. We have two major movements in the, Pharisee, in the world of the Pharisees, the house of Hillel and the house of Shammai. And they were so vitriolically opposed to one another that they threatened to literally tear the Torah apart. If I'm not mistaken, and I didn't do any, I didn't, I didn't look up this source, so somebody correct me if I'm wrong. But I believe that there is a story of the house of Shammai inviting some students of Hillel to come and meet together. And when they did, the house of Shammai slaughtered them all. Do I have, somebody online check me. I think, I have, I think I, I'm remembering that right. Maybe not. At any rate, there is an amazing schism even just in the Pharisee camp. Not to mention all the other, there's a baseless hatred. There's sinat hinam between the people of Israel. Now, Israel has always been a, the smallest nation surrounded by larger nations. How important is it then for the nation to be together in unity? They have no chance of survival if they're not together. Hey, listen, even if they're committing acts of idolatry and all those things, if they're together, they can repent together and come back to return to Hashem together. But if they're separated, there's no hope for a coalescence except by the hand of God. And I want to make a, a, a draw uh, towards us, draw a parallel towards us. Those of us who have not found our place in the Christian church, and yet we can't find our place in the Jewish world, are very small in number. Very, very small in number. I'll say this like I said all the time. We don't, re I wish Kyle was here. Oh, by the way, y'all pray for Kyle. This week, he got back from North Dakota, had a wonderful trip, came back, got hit with COVID and kidney stone. So please, he's, he's feeling better, but that's why he's not here today. He'll be back with us next week, Brother Ron Hashem. So Kyle can tell you, and he will tell you, he was at Darren and Tamara's the last two Shabbat. And he said, sitting there watching you guys online, and then at 12, 12, 15, you go, okay, love you guys, see you later. And then it turns off. And he's like, I just was left with this, like, oh, what now? So we may not understand because we're, we're spoiled and we're, we're grateful to have this community. But those of us in this walk, this non-Jewish Torah walk, are very, very small. So you would think that it would behoove us to stick together. And yet, we have as many divisions as either Christianity or Judaism does in their long, long, long history. In our last 40, 50, 60 years of being a thing, we have more division than either one of them in their thousands of year history. Why is God not growing this movement and why did it not take on like wildfire? And why did it not manifest to be the revival in the end days like we all believe it should be? Can I propose to you that it may be because of Sinat Hinam? You don't pronounce the name the same way I do. You don't keep the calendar the same way that I do. You don't believe the earth is shaped the way that I do. You don't believe, just, base, just baseless hatred. Just stupid, baseless hatred. So, Isaiah 1. The Chazon, the vision of Isaiah, son of Amoz, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Yotam, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. So, this is to the southern kingdom. This vision is to the southern kingdom. Remember, the northern kingdom is just about to be taken by Assyria, the writings on the wall. They're just about to be taken by Assyria. And the southern kingdom is feeling both angst, like, are we next? But also a little bit of sense of self-righteousness, like, well, that's what you guys deserve. You should have stuck with us. This is what you deserve. And so there's a little angst, or a lot of angst, but there's also some self-righteousness. 
there. And so Isaiah shows up and goes, hey, guys. <laughs> and everybody goes, oh, boy. Verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for Hashem has spoken. Now, we're going to take some time on these preliminary verses, and then we'll, we'll get moving here in just a second. I, I love this phrase, and I think this phrase is fascinating. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. So one of the things that we try to do is we try to hear what the original hearers would have heard. Think what they would have thought. What do they understand when they hear these words? So we think about heavens and earth. I want This is some homework. Go online, go in a Bible program you have on your phone, some will do it, and search the phrase heavens and earth or heaven and earth. And then I'll see you in about six months when you've read all the different passages that include this call to heaven and earth. It's fascinating. Here, I'm just going to give you a little Cliff Notes version. We have in Deuteronomy 32, Moses uses this same phrase. Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak. Let the earth hear the words of my mouth. Almost verbatim what Isaiah says. This is important because all of the prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Hosea, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, all of the prophets find their validity in Mosaic succession. M Moses, was, Moses gave a word that there will be one like that will come after me right? Whose sandal I'm not, you know that, that passage. All of the prophets saw themselves as a part of that tradition. The one that Moses was talking about, we believe, of course, is Messiah. But all of the prophets of Israel saw themselves in that tradition, a mosaic succession. So when we think about heavens and earth, where's the first time we hear heavens and earth? What's in the very first verse of our Bible. In the bara, right? Bereshit bara et Elohim. Elohim et Hashemayim v'haaretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And from the very first verse of our Bible, the heavens and the earth are a theme all the way through. So here's just a few more. The heavens and earth are used in a blessing attributing uh, of, of attribution to God. And this is in Melchizedek in Genesis 14. Um, where God, where Abraham, uh, Melchizedek says, "Blessed be Abraham by El Elyon, creator of heaven and earth." It's used in covenant promise. Think about Abraham. What does God tell Abraham about his descendants? They'll be as numerous as the, and as numerous as the, right, the stars in the sky and the sands, heaven and earth. They're used, heaven and earth were used in an oath. In Genesis 14, the kingdom, uh, the king of Sodom says to Abraham, give me the people and take the possessions for yourself. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I raise my hand in oath to Adonai El Elyon, creator of heaven and earth. All right? Dreams of promise is what I called this one. Genesis 28 and Jacob's ladder. There was a ladder set on the reaching to the and Jacob said, this is what? The house of God, Bethel. Heaven and earth is used as a covenant witnesses. This is really important. Deuteronomy 4, 25 and 27. I call heaven and earth against you. Heaven and earth are witnesses. Why are heaven and earth such strong witnesses in a... In a, in a um, in a court case, let's say. Because you as a witness, first of all, you could die. Second of all, you can be manipulated to tell a different story. You can be bribed. You can be changed. Heaven and earth are eternal. And heaven and earth are what they are. As a matter of fact, God is the one who creates heaven and earth and establishes the rhythms of heaven and earth. And so they are on his side. And they cannot be manipulated.
And then finally, just for this little smattering, Matthew 5, we all know this. Yeshua himself uses heaven and earth. When he's talking about the Torah. And he says, do not think I came to abolish the Torah or prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. I tell you that until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or jot or tittle, however we say that, shall pass from the Torah until all things come to pass. So this, what the original hearers probably would have heard whenever they, whenever Israel says, oh, and Isaiah says, hear, O oh, O oh, heavens and and O oh, and O oh, earth, all of this context is swimming around in their heads. Creation, promises to Abraham, blessings of God, all these things of what heaven and earth stand for. Let's keep reading. He says, Children have I raised and exalted, but they rebelled against me. An ox knows his owner, and a donkey donkey his master's trough. But Israel does not know, and my people does not perceive. Those of you that have animals, our, sh- our sheep, they're super spoiled. You, they hear the door, the front door open, and they immediately run to the fence. Uh, like, they've got fields that are now green, Baruch Hashem, fields of grass. And yet, they hear the door squeak open, and they run to the fence. They're not stupid. They just know, hey, that's the person that feeds me. It's not complicated. It's not mysterious. And God says, an ox knows and a donkey knows. But my children Israel, the height of creation, humanity, has rebelled against me. They don't perceive. Verse 4, woe, O sinful nation, O people weighted down by iniquity, offspring of evil, destructive children. They have forsaken Hashem. They have angered the Holy One of Israel. They have turned away backward. That word woe is, uh, we can think about it like, you know, like woe, like, uh, you know, the, like woe, Harsi. But the Hebrew word is hoy, where the Yiddish word comes from, oi. You ever heard that? Oy vey. It's this anguish, it's this, ugh. Come on. You know, like when you tell your children to pick up their shoes from out of the door 15,000 times, and you open the door and you trip over them. That feeling, that, ugh, that's, that's woe. That's hoy or oy. Um, Kyle just said, uh, Talmud Bavli Shabbat 17a and Talmud Yerushalami Ford 1 describes the incident between Shammai and Hillel. Thank you, bud. All right, uh, <laughs> even with the Rona and a kidney stone, he's killing it. All right, uh, <laughs> let's see, where are we? Uh, yeah, verse 5. For what would you be smitten when you, uh, when, when you still re- uh, continue waywardly, each head with sickness and each heart with pain? From the foot sole to the head, nothing is in his hole. Sword slash, contusion, festering wound. They have not medicated and contusion and festering wound they have, uh, I'm sorry, and have not bandaged, and it was not softened with oil. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, before you, strangers consume it. It is desolate as if overturned by strangers. In other words, look around, guys. Look around. Now, again, I'll go back to my previous soapbox. I'm, somebody that's crafty, build me a box. That I can stand on and get, no? Okay. I just think it'd be really cute and funny and cheeky. All right. This goes back to my Joel 2 rant where we can have this idea of looking around at destruction and going, man, Satan's really working overtime. No. No. Or at least if he is, we need to know that it's not Hashem and it is him. The first place we should go is, Father, what are you doing? What's going on? What do I need to change? Is this, what is, is this correction? Is this testing? Is this adversary to make me stronger? What is going on? And our knee-jerk reaction needs not to look at the world around us and go, man, Satan's really on the move, like he's a match for God. But we need to look to the Father 
and say, okay, our life is burning, our cities are desolate, our, our whatever, things look really, really bad. What are we supposed to do? Tell us what to do. Tell us what to repent of. Tell us where we need to be. And God will. Verse 8, the daughter of Zion. That's a beautiful phrase, a beautiful uh, image. The daughter of Zion, Zion shall be like a deserted watchman's booth in a vineyard, like a shed in a gourd garden, like a city under siege. Had not Hashem, master of legions, left us a trace of a remnant? Not a remnant, a trace of a remnant. We would have been like Sodom. We would have been like Gomorrah. Daughter of Zion. There is, I'm not going to read all this because I don't want to run out of time. But um, by the way, these notes that I have with all the links will be posted when I post the video tomorrow on our website. So you can check out the notes. There is a fantastic web, uh, website um, called uh, the uh, Jewish Women's Alliance, I think is what it's called. Um, fantastic, fantastic website uh, that has a, a really neat write-up on Daughter of Zion uh, that you can go and read. It, it, the web, everything on the website is fantastic. Uh, but this idea of Daughter of Zion is, is really, really powerful. So that's another, that's homework two, uh, number two. He says, the daughter of Zion shall be left like a deserted watchman's booth in a vineyard. Now, if you have Genesis in your bones like I do, this should trigger something for you. And this whole world of temple and priests and Kedusha and all this stuff, what I want you to start to understand is all these things work together. They all pile on top of each other, right? They all map on top of each other. Like a deserted watchman's booth in a vineyard. I, re I think about Genesis, the second chapter, and it says, God planted a garden in Eden. A vineyard is a, is a, a picture of sacred space. It's a picture of the presence of God in the temple. And God planted a garden in Eden, and then he took this man, Adam, and Hava, and he created them for priestly service. How do we know that? How do we know that Adam was a priest? Because of the words that are used to describe Adam's vocation. God said, you are to avod v'shamar. Avod is serve. Shamar is keep or guard. That's what Adam was told to do. Adam and Hava were told to do in the garden. Keep and guard. Well, what does that have to do with them being priests? The only other place that that job description shows up is when God is talking to the Kohanim. And he tells them, you are to avod v'shamar my mishkan, my tabernacle. So did Adam and Eve have the garb? And all? That's not, the, the idea is the function. The duty of Adam and Hava were to guard the vineyard, let's say. Now, why does this connect to this? Because he says, the people of Jerusalem, Jerusalem is like, it's going to be like a watchtower, an abandoned watchtower in a vineyard. So, what is the vineyard? Anybody know? Take a guess. Just shout something out. What is the vineyard? Here, I'm going to draw my really bad example. How crap are you if you can't even draw circles? I mean, really. Circles, circles are hard. All right. What is the holiest spot on earth? <laughs> Temple Mount. Right? Har Habayit, the mountain of the house. What's the next holiest spot from there? Inside the walls of Jerusalem. So Har Habayit, inside the walls of Jerusalem. Jerusalem. What's the next holiest from there? The, the land of Israel, okay? If you have a humush in the back, it gives the phases of Kedusha in the land of Israel. It's really fascinating. He's talking to Jerusalem, and he's saying, it's going to be like a watchtower that's abandoned in a vineyard. In other words, Jerusalem... Har Habayat, Jerusalem is the vineyard. 
And the people of Jerusalem were supposed to be functioning in the priestly way of protecting and guarding Jerusalem. Not only from enemies, but guarding Jerusalem from impurity, from idolatry, from all these things. One thing I didn't mention about the first century schism, the Sinat Hinam in first century, not only did you have the Pharisees fighting each other and all these people, but when Rome came to, uh, when they were uh, pillaging Jerusalem and they were about to capture the temple, the, the priests locked themselves in the temple. They were still making offerings. They, were locked, they locked themselves in the temple. And the hist- Josephus tells us that the priests turned on each other and started killing each other. They were more worried about killing each other than the enemy outside. They were worried about the enemy inside instead of the enemy outside. Is that not a picture of where we are today? My youth pastor told me 35 years ago, Christians are the only ones who shoot their wounded. Jerusalem is a vineyard. And the people of Jerusalem, the Levites, the Kohanim, the everyday baker and bread maker and and the the grandmother spinning on her wheel, whatever, we're all supposed to be watchmen in Jerusalem because Jerusalem is a vineyard. It is the holy place of God. And I just want you to see those things map over each other because it's really important. He goes on. I love this. He goes like, "Your, your leaders are like Sodom and Gomorrah. And everybody's got to go like, okay, wait, that's a little far. So in verse 10, he goes, hear, O chiefs of Sodom, hear, O people of Gomorrah. I'll just call you that because that's what you are. And here we go. Here gets the good stuff. Why do I need your numerous offerings, says Hashem? I am satiated with your korban olah, your elevation offerings of rams and the choicest of fatted animals. The choicest. Of fatted animals. Sorry. And the blood of bulls and sheep and he goats I do not desire. See? There you go. Close the book. Thank God for Jesus and doing away with the law. Because God never wanted it anyway. Okay. Well, self-righteous Christian. Let's read again. Verse 13. You shall not continue to bring a worthless meal offering. Incense of abomination is it unto me. Here's a cool thing about, well, I'll get to that in a second. Remind me to get back to incense. New moon and Sabbath, calling of convocation, I cannot abide with a a mendacity with assemblage. Your new moons and your appointed festivals, my soul hates. They have become a burden upon me that I am weary of bearing. The king of the universe gets weary. He gets tired. I think that's, those words just like, ugh. I'm weary of bearing them. There's more evidence that God hated the sacrificial system. Verse 15. And when you spread your hands in prayer... I will hide my eyes from you, even if you were to increase prayer. I do not hear. Your hands are full of blood. So, this this is all temple language, right? This is all having to do with with the temple. The, The temple is the world of Israel. It's the whole world of Israel. It's the center. I mean, it's literally the center of the world of Israel. This is all having to do with temple language. What's one really interesting thing about the incense. So the, just a a quick, super quick, we're gonna be doing more of this, frankly, as I learn more. But this, this structure that we have This right here, this area right here is called the Court of the Women. Kind of a misnomer because all normal normal Israelites gathered here. If you were an Israelite, you gathered here and waited for the service to begin. Now, this place, Gentiles, those of the nations could not come into here. 
there is around the temple a, a short wall called the Soreg that if you were from the nations, you had to stand outside of, but still in pretty close, close proximity. This is the core of the women where all of Israel gathered. This is the Nicanor Gate. Many of you have heard about the Nicanor Gate. This is the Nicanor Gate, right? And then this area here, uh, and you can look at this afterwards. I know it's hard to see. That's why I need the bigger one. Um, <laughs> you have the court of Israel where every week a certain selection of men from every tribe in Israel came to stand before the altar and offer prayers and offerings on behalf of their community, their tribe, which is cool. And then you have steps that lead up to the court of the priests, and then you have the altar, and then you have the slaughterhouse, the outside slaughterhouse right here, uh, where most holy communal offerings were done. And then you have what's called uh, the ulam, or the porch, steps leading up to the porch. And then you have the main temple building itself proper. We talked about in the Torah, Moshe would go to the Ohel Moed. You remember that phrase? What does that mean? Tent of meeting. The tent of meeting is made up of two different divisions, right? The holy place and the most holy place. This right here is the Ohel Moed, basically, right? So you have the holy place here and you have the holy of holies here. Now, what's inside the holy place? You have the menorah. You have the, the uh, Shulchan Lechem HaPanim, the table of showbread. And you have the Mizbeach Ketorah, the incense off altar. And the priest would take all uh, um, ash, uh, coals, excuse me, off the altar and bring into the incense altar and burn incense. Now, the incense was made of all kind of different spices we'll get into later. And one of the spices in particular wasn't necessarily about the fragrance. It was about its function because that, that spice caused the smoke of the incense altar to go straight up in a column. Usually smoke will billow, right, and it'll fill and spread. This mixture of spice caused the, the, the smoke to go straight up. Now, I said we were going to study and start looking into the Siddur because it's important. The Siddur, the prayers of the Siddur, go like, oh, well, those are prayers the rabbis made up. And they're, we're not, the Bible says we're not supposed to pray prayers of rote. Okay, both of those things are wrong. The prayer, the Siddur, is actually, the order of the prayers is mapped over the temple. So in one section of prayers, you're out here getting ready for worship. The next section of prayers, you're in here. The next section, you're in here. The next section, you're in here until you come to the Holy of Holies is where the Siddur prayers bring you to, which makes it phenomenal. What we know through Mishnah and, and Torah study and Joe Good and his team and some of the things that they were studying is that as the priest is standing at the incense offering, offering incense, the smoke rises is it about the incense? No. What is happening outside? The priests and the people of Israel, they are saying a prayer that we call the Amidah. Who knows what Amidah stands for? I just told you. Yeah. Standing prayer. So as the priest is standing, doing the incense offering, and the incense smoke is rising, the nation of Israel or the worshipers that are there for that day or whatever, are standing outside, standing, doing the Amidah, this 18-section prayer. So it's not about the incense, it's about the prayers. The incense is just a, an illustration of the prayers that are going up. And that's why it's important to know these things and to see again that all of these things lap on top of each other. Even in the Siddur, you start out here. And then you move to this place, and you move to this place, and you move to this place, finally to where you're in the presence of God himself. I want to make sure I don't forget anything. So does God hate sacrifices and offerings? Well, if he did, he would be kind of bipolar or schizophrenic because he's the one that told him to bring it. So there's something else going on. Here's Proverbs 15.8. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to Adonai, but the prayer of the upright pleases him. Proverbs 21, 27. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination, 
how much more would he brings it with evil intent? Mm. Proverbs 28, 9. One who turns his ear from hearing the Torah, even his prayer is an abomination. So, as we remember Rabbi Hirsch's words about are what we doing just perfunctory performance or what, what, is, what are we doing about, this, what I want you to hear today and what I want you to leave with is not, not a negative view of the Jewish people or of Israel at this time. It's not about that. God dealt with them about that, sent them into exile. What I want us to hear is that the word of God was not written to us, but it was written for us. And so this is not me saying, telling you that all your prayers are an abomination. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that God in his infinite mercy has given us wisdom from someone else's experience to say, make sure you don't cross this line. Make sure that you read Israel's history and that you read their story and that you don't fall into the trap that you don't let your heart become complacent, that you don't let your mind become distracted by everything else. And it comes down to one word. And, th and this, when I hear people talk about the siddur and the, and the prayers, and I hear criticisms about like, well, the ra those are words of men, the rabbis made them up or whatever. When you get your siddur, you're going to see the prayers, and after almost every line, there's a scripture quote. They didn't make stuff up. They pulled scripture together and put it in prayer form for the most part. Now, there are some prayers that were added by sages and stuff. That's fine. We all came into the kingdom by a prayer that was made up. Did we not? Not <laughs> for everyone but Casey, just as a, as a find the sinner's prayer in the Bible. P.S. is not there. So, do, so don't talk to me about they made stuff up. We can't say, uh-uh, no, 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 no. Do a mirror check. Look in the mirror and then come talk to me. The beginning of, of any conversation by Jewish people or by sages and scholars and rabbis on prayer Anytime they talk about it, it always, it always is about this. And since you all can read Hebrew, I don't need to translate it. No. This, this word, this word, is like, I wish I had neon, neon lights, is translated as kavanah. Now, those of you here Wednesday night, you know what this word means. Tell us. Intention. 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 Kavana. God is not saying, I don't want your offerings. God is not saying, I don't want new moons and Sabbath celebrations and all of that. The, 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 the term means to an end seems to be derogatory. It's not derogatory. It just puts things in its proper place in the process. The Shabbat, the temple building is a means to an end. Why do I say that? Because it's to teach us how to live with the presence of God living in us. That's what its, that's what its point is. The first temple the same. The second temple the same. The third temple will be the same. Shabbat is a means to an end. As holy as it is, it is to teach us about what is to come and to give us a break from this life of toil and strain and stress. To commune with God with no distraction. The festivals are a means to an end. The calendar, all these things we talk about are a means to an end. How do we know that? How can I prove that? Because God says stop doing all of it. If you don't have the right kavanah, you don't have the right intention. And to give it to the church, because I've blasted them a pretty good bit today, this is one thing we got right. If your heart's not right, if your heart's not right, 
God doesn't want anything you have to offer. Intention is about kavana. Your heart being right. Your intention being right. God says, stop all the perfunctory performance stuff. And I would tell us, as non-Jews with not a temple standing, stop all the performance prayer and the performance worship and the dancing around and the falling out and the music and the show and all of it. Stop all of it. It stinks before God. If this is not right. If Kavanah is not right. And here's the thing. This is not Billy Graham or Joel Osteen or somebody else telling you this. You read any rabbi who talks about prayer, and they're going to tell you the same thing. Your heart is not right. God doesn't even want your prayers that are in this book, the Siddur. If our kavanah, our intention is not correct. So this passage in Isaiah, when, the, when Christianity has used it as a weapon against the Jewish people and against the Torah, really it should have been a gun turned on us. We should have used it as a weapon turned on our own selves. Not to weaponize against another group of people to prove ourselves is right, but a, a weapon on us so that we can audit and we can make sure that our hearts are right and we can make sure that we're not falling into this trap and into this, this thing. The, the Proverbs, when we talk about Proverbs, uses this word abomination. This will be homework point number three. First was heavens and earth. Second was daughter of Zion. Third is abomination. Go to Leviticus 18, chapter 18 and after chapter 20, and read about what God has said is an abomination. Abomination is one of the strongest words that there are in Hebrew, in biblical Hebrew. Go read about what God says are an abomination. And then remember that Proverbs says that even prayer is an abomination if our hearts are against the Torah. It's not Joe saying that. It's the word of God saying it. So, Let's keep reading. He says in verse 16, wash yourselves, purify yourselves, remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes, desist from doing evil, learn, stop it, stop it. Do you have sin in your life? Don't raise your hands. <laughs> Do you have sin in your life? No, I've said this before and I, I believe this or else I would not be standing here this morning. Since we know now that there are things called intentional and unintentional sin and God treats those things differently, so glad we learned that. I don't believe anybody listening to me in this room and or listening to me online goes through their day intentionally committing outright rebellious sin. I don't think any of us do that. Do we have sometimes where we go like, I really shouldn't, but I'm going to? Sure. But to have a life that is driven by rebellious, consistent sin, I know to my best of my knowledge, I don't. Now, my background would tell me, oh, that's just your pride. You're being deceived. And I say, get behind me, Satan, because it's the truth. And I don't know any of you that do that. Do we accidentally sin unintentionally and mess up? Sure. Now, I'm not trying to get us out of jail here. We do have intentional sin. Don't get me wrong. But we are not cumbered by intentional sin. And for that, I say, Baruch Hashem. Thank God. That's the point. The point of Yeshua and all the study and all of listening to God and, and, and being, being surrendered to God and his presence and his spirit and being led and all. The reason for all that, while we have a hundred Bibles and we study all this stuff and we meet together, is so that we're not encumbered by sin. And you know what? It's working. Woo! It's working. Can you imagine still being a part of a church that every Sunday you had to drag in full of shame and guilt and go, I don't even know how, but I'm pretty sure I was really bad this week. I'm sure the preacher is going to tell me how awful I was this week. Thank God that he broke us from that toxic theology, from that toxic doctrine to go, you know what? I, yeah, I own it. I mess up. There's sometimes that I'm still not surrendered to God in some areas, and I see things that are destructive, but like, I just do them. And in those things, I have to constantly come back to God and say, I failed, I'm sorry, I will do better next time, and sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. 
But our lives are not the dirge of sin. They are not. Because, because Yeshua works. The gospel works. The Torah works. It refines us into who we're supposed to be. It refines our kavanah through study and through prayer and through worship. The plan of God works. Well, I'm glad I'm excited about it. I'll be excited by myself. I don't care. He says, wash your, so wash yourselves and purify yourselves. This is a ritual act, right? One of the cool things about studying the temple is you start to learn this Kedusha stuff. And so this part of the, this part of the temple complex, this part right here is called the Azara. The Azara, where the altar and, and uh, slaughterhouse are, the Azara. Now, a priest that comes for duty, right? He comes his week. It's his week. He comes for duty. He comes to work or a Levite. They come from out here, right? Whatever. They wash in like the pool of Siloam or one of the other mikvahot that are around. There's, you know, tons of mikvahot all around the Temple Mount. He comes in here. He comes into this building, Beit Aftinus, which is like the administrative part of the temple. It's where the Sanhedrin met, the Hall of Hewn Stones, where the temple, uh, the calendar was cited, and all, or was a uh, moon was... Uh, confirmed and all that stuff comes into here and in here is the kior what's called the kior which is the basin where the priests were told to wash your hands and feet right is in this building once he in it's right here next to the azara the azara has a higher holiness than this place this is the circles right that we talked about so if you put the holy of holies right here the circles work here does that make sense this is holier than this, it's holier than this, it's holier than this, it's holier than this, right? So once he enters the Azara, there's no going back for his time of service. If he becomes unclean in the process, he's out for the week. And he has to wait until his next time to serve, right? So every Levite and priests before every person, but every Levite and priest, especially before they come to do their service, their avodah, would have to wash, right? There's a ritual aspect to this, a part of cleaning yourself up. And that's exactly what Isaiah says. He says, wash yourselves and be clean, purify yourselves, but it's not just about ritual. You can't just come in and wash and then like, okay, I'm ready to serve. What if the priest comes in and he got cut off on the road. Some jerk cut him off on the road on the way up to the temple. Or some idiot is driving slow in the left-hand lane. And he just, he just gets out of his mind angry. And he comes into the temple for his time of service. And he's still fuming. His face is still red. He's still grumbling. And he goes to the cure. And he washes hands and feet and walks into the Azara. I'm ready for service. Is he ready for service? I tell you what would probably have happened. God talks a lot in the Torah about if you trespass this place, you'll die, right? Don't come to this place, you'll die. It's not that the presence of God would kill people who were trespassing. It's that the Levitical guard, you know, there's Levites. And the Levites, a lot of them are serving. You know, they're serving, doing offerings, doing whatever. But there's also Levites and priests that are warriors. And they're stationed on the top of these buildings, and they're stationed all around. They're the temple police. The people that took Yeshua away, those were Levites or Kohanim. And they're standing up here with bows and arrows. And if they see anybody encroaching or worshiping in a way that they're not allowed to, then they kill them. So it's not even that you have to worry about the presence of God. It's that you have to worry about the, each other. <laughs> hey, if we come to a place where we're encroaching where we're serving God in an unclean manner in our hearts, I hope that we have one another, not to kill us, but to hold us accountable. There's a lot of accountability if a priest is standing over you with a bow and arrow to go like, I better do stuff. Woo! I better do stuff right, right? There should also be that same that same accountability, that same spirit of accountability when we realize we are part of a community. We're part of a community, and what I do affects everybody else. Not like I'm the center of the universe, but my attitude affects other people, and your attitude affects me. 
when we're doing worship and y'all are singing and I can hear your voices, oh, it just makes me want to, ah, yes. And when I feel like I'm singing to empty chairs and I can hear my own voice bouncing off the back wall, I'm like, why am I even doing this? That's not to guilt you, just a little bit. But it, our attitudes affect each other. What we do affect each other. The way, we, the way we treat our spouses affects each other. The way we raise our kids affects each other. All right, let's finish this up. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Strengthen the victim. Do justice for the orphan. Take cause for the widow. Verse 18, go forth now. Let us reason together. God, I wish I had time for this. Let us reason together, says, says Hashem. So he just finished absolutely blasting the children of Israel, right? Stop bringing me that, that my blood. I am I'm tired because you won't just do right. Have you, have you ever had that attitude towards your kids? <laughs> last, last night. All right, so you ever feel like that with your kids? You just make me so tired because you won't do what I'm asking you. Just do what I'm asking you to do, and there'll be shalom in the home, <laughs> right? That's what God's saying. Finally, you, you get to a point as a parent where it's screaming and yelling and kicking stuff and throwing stuff. I mean, none of y'all do that, obviously. I'm speaking of me. Um, that doesn't work. Sometimes you come to a point where you go, okay, look, come sit down. Come sit. Look, look at me in the eye. Let's, let's talk. Can we talk about it? Because obviously all the other stuff is not working. Let's, let's talk about it. And that's what Hashem is saying. As the ultimate father, he's saying, look, I've, I've, I've done everything I knew to do. And nothing is working. The last resort is look me in the eyes. Let's reason together. Let's talk. Right? In other words, God is saying, if, if you kind of break down what this phrase is about, God is saying, bring your case before me. Accuse me, is what God's saying. Accuse me. Tell me what I've done to make you act this way. Tell me what I haven't given you. Tell me what I haven't, what I haven't provided for you to make you act like this. Accuse me, and let's, let's talk it out. Which... Against a culture, against the background of cultures surrounding Israel where all they were about was appeasing their gods, this is absolutely revolutionary. You mean there's actually the creator of the heavens and the earth that will listen to my case? I mean, I'll be wrong in the end, but at least he'll listen and, and we can reason together. It's pretty fantastic. He says, though, and this is one of the other verses we know so well. Though your, or if your sins, if your sins will be like scarlet, they will whiten like snow. If they, if they have reddened like crimson, they will become as wool. So let me just say this. Uh, this is a point number four in homework if you're taking notes. Um, there's a lot to do with this about, um, and we talked about it Wednesday night, and I found out some more information since then. So uh, this thing about, what is this thing about scarlet to white, crimson to white? What, what, is, what is this all about? Is this just a metaphor or whatever? So several years ago, someone found um, or heard this story about the Yom Kippur, the Day of, of Atonement, where they would tie a scarlet ribbon around the goat, the horns of the goat. And if the priest was successful in his service, then the thread would turn white and the people would, would know that they had been forgiven for the year and atoned for for the year. And what has happened is people have gone, well, that's what this is talking about. And then it, they take it to the next thing. They go, well, you know, the story is that in the last 40 years of the temple, the thread did not turn white, stayed scarlet. And then we go, oh, well, you know what that means. What year was the temple destroyed? 70. 70 A.D. or C.E., right? How old was Jesus when he was killed? 
It's the last 40 years. Because the Jews rejected Jesus, the, the thread didn't turn white anymore. That sounds really, yeah. Stupid Jews. But if we're going to reason, see what I did there? The temple was destroyed in 70, and Yeshua doesn't die until 33. That's not 40 years. There's actually three years, the last three years of Yeshua's life, where the thread actually did turn white. So that kind of doesn't work. And the rabbis say that the temple wasn't destroyed in 70. It was actually destroyed in 68 or 69. So it would be like the last five years of Yeshua's life where the thread actually turned white again. See, we conflate these things. That, and a matter of fact, this whole thing can be read. If you have Safari or you have the app or you can go on Safari, Safari S-E-F-A-R-I-A. This is in uh, Talmud Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud, Yoma 39b. And you can read the whole thing. It's not just a scarlet thread. It's that the doors of the temple would open and close by themselves. And there's a whole thing about a rabbi seeing ghosts and all this kind of, it's really cool. So what is this red to white thing about? Well, just very simply, red in the ancient world is one of the most saturating dyes you can possibly have. And once something gets dyed red from a little worm, uh, a little crimson worm, it's called uh, Talat Sheni. Once it gets dyed red, there's no going, like there's no Clorox. There's no going back. And so at a very just literal level, this just means that your sin has stained who you are. But if you will repent, your repentance and my mercy will make you clean again. That's just really the, the Baptist got that one right. Props to them, <laughs> right? He says in verse 19, if you will be willing and you will obey, you will eat the goodness of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword for the mouth of Hashem has spoken. In other words, God's saying, I said what I said. Okay. Verse 21, how she has become a harlot, faithful city that was of justice in which righteousness was wont to lodge, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, which is a whole other thing in itself, and your, and your heady wine mixed with water. In other words, your wine isn't even good anymore. It's all diluted. Your princes are wayward and associates of thieves. The whole of them loves bribery and pursue illegal payments. Hello? For the orphan, they do not do justice. The cause of the widow they, does not come to them. Here's the thing about this passage is that Israel's repentance is not super spiritual. He goes like, get your leaders in check. Tell them to stop being thieves. And you guys that are not in leadership, help them. Hold them accountable. And hey, when you see somebody that's hungry next door, go feed them. When you see a child that's orphaned, take care of them. When you see a woman that's widowed and struggling, cover her and protect her and take care of her. It's not, it's not like hyper-spiritual, mysterious. How do we get God back in our favor? Do the right stuff. It's, it's, not, it's not hard. It's not spiritual. I mean, not overly, you know, mysterious is what I mean. And then lastly, verse 24. Therefore, the word of Hashem, master of legions, mighty one of Israel. Oh, how I will ease myself of my adversaries and how I will avenge myself of my enemies. I will return my hand upon you and refine you as... Uh, as with lie of dross, I will remove all your base metal. I will return your judges as in earlier times, your counselors as at first. After that, you shall be called city of righteousness, faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed with justice and her return uh, and returnees with righteousness. Now, another translation I read says, and this is so cool. Verse 27, Zion shall be redeemed Instead of with justice, by justice. And her returnees, by righteousness. Oh, this is what is, oh, I just love this so much because it's so different than where I came from. You mean, I have a part in the redemption process? Israel, the Jewish people have a, uh, the, the Jerusalemites had a part in the redemption process. How does verse 27 say that they can be redeemed? 
Do righteousness. Do justice. That's how you redeem Jerusalem. How do we redeem America? We need more people to start doing justice and doing righteousness. That's how we redeem America. How do we redeem DeRitter or Rose Pond or Leesville or St. Landry Parish or St. Borgard Parish or Avoyles Parish or whatever? How do we redeem our communities? We lock ourselves in a closet and we pray and fast. Great. And then after you get out of the closet, eat something and get to work. They were redeemed, verse 27 says, by righteousness and their returnees with justice. By doing righteous, by doing justice, they are redeemed. And again, this is not earning our salvation. This is not that discussion at all. We're already saved. But we've been wayward. And so how do we come back? We make shuva. To shuva, we repent. What does that mean? It doesn't mean saying I'm sorry. It means do different stuff. Period. So this first chapter of Isaiah, there's a hundred other things that we could have gone into. So let me just encourage you on this, this year of Tisha B'Av. Um, if you feel to fast, fast is, fasting is a way of mourning. And so if you feel to fast, even a part of the day or whatever it is, please you know, do that. Um, there's a couple of links I'm going to put on our Facebook page. And for those of you that are on Facebook, I'm sorry. I, it's hard to get other, you know, to get other information um, without printing stuff out. Um, but I'll post some links. At, at the very least, this is what I'll ask you to do. At the very least, tonight through tomorrow, have this idea of Jerusalem and the temple on your mind. Now, some people are listening to me and they're saying, we're like, I don't even believe the third temple is supposed to be built. That's fine. I understand that, and I, I understand your reasoning, and some days I agree, and some days I think differently. I don't know yet, but, but listen, at least understand that this, this sacred space is not just about a building. This is a means to an end. It's not just about this building. This is a model for how creation functions, and that's what I want you to understand. So if, if, you're not, if you don't mourn the temple or whatever it is tomorrow, at least have a thought towards Jerusalem and the holy city and the coming kingdom and be expectant and be waiting and aware for that, that coming and be in prayer for that coming. May it come speedily and in our days, the messianic kingdom and the Messiah himself.